Welcome everyone, everywhere, friends, family, brothers and sisters in Christ, those who may not know Christ yet. What a privilege it is to have you join along for this message, this topical message on that of the heart of God, sinful man and repentance, turning from sin to God, acknowledging we are sinners, acknowledging we fall short of the grace and the glory of God, acknowledging that we need Jesus Christ, God's Son, sent, sent to die for our sins on the cross, that we may be forgiven through Him, that He was scourged and beaten and mocked and ridiculed in ways we could never imagine. Even with what is written and we see, we could not imagine or fathom the grotesque nature of his suffering on our behalf. But he rose again three days after giving his life up on the cross for sinners like us. That we may be forgiven, that we may receive the Holy Spirit and have victory and walk, walk in oneness with God. Not just in the first act of repentance, but living a life, a life thereof, of repentance. Acknowledging our sin as it's brought forth to us through the word, through others, through conviction of the Holy Spirit. And we say, Lord, we can't, you can we're trusting you to help us to overcome everything we are going through, everything we falter in. We know your grace is sufficient and your strength is able to guide us through and through, by and by, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so if you're with me now, we're going to go through some scriptures. We're going to go through some examples and testimonies of what repentance looks like through the biblical text. As we see it come alive in scripture, those who have indeed repented, some in the Old Testament, some in the New, but we get to look at some examples up close, and then we get to look into a little bit of a topical teaching or discussion, if you will, about repentance, and then dive into a quote from an ancestor of the faith, and then we'll come back here together again, and we will talk about how this impacted us, if this taught us anything new, if this helped us in any way, and leave off with a few questions that we can answer in the here and now, and even meditate on going forward. And I know by the Spirit of God, and by the grace of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, that He is going to help us rise above. He is going to help us overcome. He is going to help us endure to the end of the age and the race of faith through Jesus Christ, His Son. And if you believe that too, say amen and type it in the comment box if you feel so compelled to do so. Glory be to God our Father. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the gift of repentance, the baptism you gave to John. We thank you for Jesus, your son. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for this message and your examples and testimonies of your children throughout the years of history, your story, your truths, Father. May we be moved to grow closer to you, to draw near to you because you first loved us and gave us Jesus. And may we learn something today and walk more bolder and more assuredly in confidence and faith. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, Father. We thank you for it all. Amen. Amen. All right, first scripture. Let's go into it now. Here we are in the prophetic book of Jonah, chapter 3, Nineveh repents. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days in Nineveh will be overthrown. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Let's repeat that. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. 
When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. Verse 7. And he issued a proclamation, and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, Do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth, and let men call on God earnestly, that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger, so that we shall not perish. When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Amen. Let's fast forward now into the Gospel of Luke chapter 19, where Jesus interacts with a very sinful man, a greedy, idolatrous, covetous man named Zacchaeus. Here we go. Verse 1 of the 19th chapter to the Gospel of Luke. And he entered, he being Jesus, and was passing through Jericho. And behold, there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax gatherer, and he was rich. And he was trying to see who Jesus was, and he was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. Verse 4. And he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly or rejoicingly. And when they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, he has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Hallelujah. Here we are now Amen. in Acts chapter 19, verses 11 through 20, the miracles at Ephesus. Verse 11, And God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out. But also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And seven sons of one Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. Verse 15. And the evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus and I know about Paul. But who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them and subdued all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all, both Jews and Greeks, who lived in Ephesus, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. Verse 18. Many also of those who had believed kept coming, confessing, and disclosing their practices. This is the key focus here. Let's repeat that. Many also of those who had believed kept coming, confessing, and disclosing their practices. And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of all. And they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. 
Hallelujah. This is beautiful, friends and family. This is a great, great description of repentance. And it is just an amazing thing. We get to view these verses and grow in faith today. Specifically and especially in the season we are in right now in all of the world. This has great pertinence. Let us grow as we continue this discussion in Jesus' name. Amen. And here in the 1978 NASB Open Bible, in Acts chapter 17, verses 30 through 34, we find a theological discussion or teaching of doctrine on repentance, if you will. And it's quite intriguing and very sound. I'd love to share this with you, body and beloved of Christ Jesus says, repentance is so important that God commands that all everywhere should repent. And let's look at the verses. Verses 30 through 34. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man, this man is Jesus, whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him, Jesus, from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, We shall hear you again concerning this. So Paul went out of their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also was Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Now anyways, that was the result of his preaching on Mars Hill, these verses 32 through 34. But nonetheless, we see the basis upon repentance and believing through Jesus Christ. So repentance is so important that God commands that all everywhere should repent. Point one is that the lost are to repent. Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And we look at Matthew 9, verse 13. Again, he said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That's Luke 13, verses 3 through 5. Backsliders in point two are to repent as well. Paul said, I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. There were fleshly Christians in the church at Corinth. In Paul's first letter to them, he called upon the church to discipline the guilty. In his second letter, he rejoices because the guilty repent. We know, brothers and sisters, family and friends, that repentance is turning from sin to God through thought, through heart, through action. Point three, the local churches are to repent. In the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter two and three, our Lord sent seven letters to seven local churches. He called upon five of the seven to repent. The church at Ephesus was to repent because she had left her first love. The church at Pergamos was to repent because she permitted the doctrine of Balaam to be taught and to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. The church at Thyatira was to repent because she tolerated Jezebel to teach and lead God's servants to commit acts of immorality. The church at Sardis was to repent because she was a dying congregation. The church at Laodicea was to repent because she thought she was rich and did not need anything. In her opinion, she had arrived. She did not know that she was neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm, and God was ready to spit her out of his mouth. The Lord called upon these five local churches to repent, or else he would remove their candlestick or lampstand, and they would cease to be a light in darkness. Now we look at these points again. The lost would repent or perish. The backslider is to repent or to be disciplined. And the local church is to repent or lose its effectiveness in a world lost in sin. And we don't want to hesitate in diving into that topic of apostasy, backsliding and turning completely from God. There is perishing in that as well. But let us, let us be disciplined. Let us walk in the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Let us be effective in lights and salt amidst a dark, fallen world. In Jesus' name. Now to wrap up this Amen. brief exposition on repentance, let us look at a quote from a Floyd McClung, an ancestor of faith. True repentance occurs when we begin to see sin from God's point of view. When we see the way our sin has broken his heart, perhaps the idea that God's heart can be broken by our sin is new to you. 
In Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, we are told, When the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. That's the NASB edition, New American Standard Bible. God was so disappointed with what he saw that there was a grief or sorrow in his heart. Jesus also was brokenhearted as he wept over Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Luke 13, verse 34. God's heart aches over our sin. It alienates us from him and from our fellow believers. If we want to have victory over sin and turn our lives wholeheartedly over to God, then we must see our sin from God's perspective. No sermon on hell can ever change a person's heart like seeing the grief sin has brought to the heart of the one who created us. We must ask God to show us what our sin does to Him. As we do this and begin to understand His great love for us, despite how much we have hurt and grieved His heart, turning away from that sin is the natural thing to do. This is the test of our sincerity and of the level of our desperation to be right with God by Floyd McClung. Let's repeat that last part. This is the test of our sincerity and of the level of our desperation to be right with God. Everybody, I hope and pray that this has strengthened and encouraged you in your faith today as this has for me. And I just want us to grow closer to God our Father through His Son Jesus and in the grace and the knowledge thereof. And I just know that if we work together in unity, I will be praying for you. Please continue to pray for me. If you've never heard it throughout this channel or if you don't know me personally, my name is Michael D. Hart. Michael James D. Hart. If you could pray for me and my family and my household and that we would just continue to grow in unity and harmony and oneness and in peace and that so too it would be for you and yours and for those who are in the faith all around and that those who know not Jesus would come to know Jesus before it be too late. I thank you for your prayers, for boldness, for strength, for fearlessness in these last days. And I pray that you would go forth in the peace of God as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us ask these questions before departing from this message and applying what we have learned here today. Question number one. This is from a devotional I do daily. It's called Time with God. It's a New Testament for busy people, it says. But it's a nice devotional to do, to look into the context of the scriptures with the New Testament and the Old Testament, and then some food for thought, some questions to bring forth conviction and change. These would be the questions for this portion here, and I would like to share these with you that we may contemplate and grow because of them. Do you think the people mentioned in these passages recognize that their sin grieved God? So let's talk about the passages we just read here today. Do we think that the people in these passages believed and recognized that their sin grieved God? Like Zacchaeus, or Zacchaeus, however you pronounce it correctly, right? Then we got that of Jonah and the people of the Nineveh. Jonah had to work through repentance too, but go and read that for yourself and, and learn through that. But also, we, we look at the New Testament, we see those who were of witchcraft and, and magic and how they put away their witchcraft and their books and their divinations and they burnt them all and sold other things for silver and they used that for the kingdom of God. Or they were worth much, much riches and money, but they burnt them out of their love for God and turning from those idolatrous, evil, wicked things. It's a beautiful thing. I believe these people did recognize their sin and how it grieved God. And at least they knew enough that God loved them and they wanted to love him in return and they began to take action with a changed heart and life. That's more than enough for me. And we see that they are plainly exemplified in the verses we went through today. It says, why would be the next question. Why? Well, go back through the texts and deep look into them and see what God is saying to you. Why do you think they did this? Why would we change? What would compel us to change? Well, it has to be nothing less or short of the grace and the love of God Almighty through His Son, Jesus Christ. 
We need his love. We need his grace. And we need his mercies every morning, every second, even now. Even now. Question three, what is the evidence that God changed their hearts? Well, we've already discussed that. We've already discussed that. Now, here comes some more convicting things. It says, how about you? How about you? How about me, right? What are some evidences that our lives have changed, that our hearts have changed, that we have truly, truly received the Holy Spirit, are truly walking with Jesus Christ, and truly love Father God. What about us? Let us think on that. Let us take as long as we need to really think and meditate on that. It says, what in your life grieves God? What in your life grieves God? What in my life grieves God? Let us examine self and let us reach out and ask for prayer. For where there is pride, may it cease and be overcome with humility. Where there is lust for riches or for, for uh, the opposite sex or for whatever it may be, lust for things, lust for pleasures, lusts for the temporary, may it be replaced with that of the eternal and joy and contentment and pleasure in God. Those are a few major topics that are usually troubling people or souls on this journey. But there could be anything, and whatever that may be, whether it be addiction, whether it be depression, whether it be worry, concern, anxiety, whether it be unbelief even, you can acknowledge that today and give it to God and he will help you. He will meet you where you're at. He will work with you through what you're going through and he will help you overcome by his sufficient love and grace. The only thing is we must believe and by true belief and faith, the change will come. You will, you will acknowledge, you will know, and you will overcome. In Christ Jesus, it will be done. And it says, will you turn away from it today? So remember the previous question was, what in your life grieves God? The final question is, will you turn away from it today? Today is the day of salvation. We're not promised tomorrow. There may not be another opportunity to turn away from that thing that we know is grieving God. Our laziness, slothfulness, anger. What is it? What is it? Because he is letting us have this opportunity to discuss this. We acknowledge, hey, I have these issues that are grieving God in the Holy Spirit. And he's saying, asking us through these questions. Will we turn away from them today? Will we do that? Will we do that today for God who so loved us that he gave his son Jesus to die for us upon the cross? That we could be forgiven and have life with him everlasting? The one who is everlasting from everlasting is able to fulfill his perfect will in us. But are we willing to give him all of us to perform that perfect will through? Let us take these thoughts let us take these questions. Let us go in the grace of the Lord. Let us, let us change today. Because the same God who called us out of the grave, the same God who called us to himself through his son Jesus in the beginning is the same God with us now, Christian. Is the same God with us now, Christ follower. Is the same God able to take you from sin and despair and a life of negligence towards himself to a relationship with himself now lost unbelieving sinner. He does not change and he is faithful through and through. Let him work in your life for the first time or again and again today and we will go in that exhortation in Jesus' name and breath. Peace, grace, and mercy be with you all by the love of God through his son Jesus Christ. Amen.